Well, hello, my name is Dr. Kretka. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, today we're gonna talk about advanced directives and I titled it Advanced Directives Beyond the Paperwork for a very specific reason, but you'll have to wait till the end to find out. So a little bit about me. Um, I went to medical school in Oklahoma and then I did a family practice residency. Um, but then I was kind of looking for more in my medical career. So I decided to go do a fellowship in hospice and palliative medicine. So I'm also board certified in palliative medicine. And that is what I do full time. Um, I have at this point about eight years of experience helping people fill out advanced directives. But more importantly, I'm one of the doctors at ground zero when we're needing to use those advanced directives. And I've been helping patients and family members work through what do we do when we get into tough situations. So I'm gonna to try to share my experience with you today um, and share what is most helpful when we get into those situations. So um, today we're gonna to have a brief overview of palliative care because I can't pass up a chance to tell you about what I do. Um, and then talk about what are goals of care because that really does drive advanced directives. And then I'm gonna walk you guys through the most commonly used advanced directives and what the state of Utah, um, what we use in this state. And then I'm gonna go through just a little bit. I want you to see things from my perspective just a little bit, the Utah laws and kind of what I'm thinking about when I'm going into a situation where I know we're gonna be using advanced directives. Um, and then throughout this whole lecture, I'm gonna try to weave in stories about patients when we had to clarify goals and use advanced directives. And so, because sometimes patient experiences help you really understand what it's like to use these. And then at the end, I'm gonna hope, I'm hoping you guys will walk away knowing what you need to do for advanced directives for yourself. So first we're gonna talk about palliative care. Raise your hand, has anybody in here ever even heard of palliative care? A couple, it's, it's a very new medical specialty. Most people have heard of hospice, but that's different than palliative care. So the World Health Organization gave us this big definition, but what the bottom line of all of this is it's an approach to prevent and relieve suffering. That's what I do for a living. I prevent and relieve suffering. So if you think of palliative care as the big specialty, so and hospice is a subspecialty of palliative care. So there are some similarities, but there are definitely some differences. I was a hospice medical director for eight years, and I don't do any hospice anymore. I only do palliative care. Um, so palliative care, we focus, so there, the differences are patients' goals. So patients' goals who are in hospice are comfort, their preference is to stay out of the hospital and pass away at home. So that's a hospice patient. Palliative care patients, I have patients that are on full life support in the ICU. Their goals can be very aggressive medically. Um, prognosis, so patients to be in hospice, you have to have a prognosis of less than six months. Palliative care patients can have any prognosis. So some of my patients actually have a normal lifespan. I would expect them to live a normal lifespan but they're also living with a chronic illness that they need help with. Um, in stage of illness, hospice, you tend to be at the end stage of a disease process. Palliative care, I can get involved when somebody has a stage one cancer. So that's not usually when hospice would get involved. Maybe the patient's still getting chemo and radiation and all those, maybe their cancer is even curable. You wouldn't find that kind of patient in hospice, okay? So, but we do both focus on quality of life um, and symptom management, just keeping people comfortable. Um, we have a team approach. So in my office, I have a nurse, I have a chaplain, I have a social worker, and I have a doctor. So it's an interdisciplinary team approach, and you'll find that same thing in hospice as well. And then the diagnoses like, that we see are pretty similar. Heart failure, COPD, chronic kidney disease, cancer, and the list goes on. So the, the type of diagnoses that we take care of are very similar. But, so palliative care is the big specialty, whereas hospice is a subspecialty of palliative care. So, so what do we do for people? Palliative care has been shown to improve patient satisfaction, improve symptom control, so people feel better and they live better. They have a better quality of life. Um, reduce healthcare utilization. You know what that means to me? People aren't in the hospital as much. They're not in the doctor's office as much. They're at home with their families. Um, and then there are new studies, this is kind of new stuff going out, that we found that palliative care can actually impact how long somebody has to live. If you're more comfortable, you're probably going to live longer. And that's what we're learning now. 
So this is a lot of words on one slide. When you come to see me, you're going to get two things. Um, you're going to get symptom management. So we're going to talk about pain, shortness of breath, nausea, all of that kind of stuff. What can I do to help you feel better? The second part to a palliative care consult, and what we're going to focus on today is called goals of care. And that's talking, basically it comes down to knowing what we know about your medical situation, what are you hoping for, and how do we help get you there? That's all goals of care is. So now I'm going to get into a little bit more depth about goals of care. There's a lot of different ways patients decide what they're hoping for, right? You know you have a medical illness. Maybe you've been given a diagnosis. Does that mean we lose all our hope? Absolutely not. Everybody has hopes. Um, and they have expectations. Sometimes those things are different. Sometimes we're really, really hoping we're going to make our grandson's graduation in two years. Are we expecting that? Maybe, maybe not. Um, outside influences can, can help, can affect our goals of care. And I, I think of outside influence, sometimes our kids. I have patients who really do make decisions based on what their kids want them to do. And that's what's really driving the overall plan. Um, sometimes religion, sometimes the culture we live in affects it. Maybe even a doctor is giving you some advice and that's really important to you and that's really driving your overall plan. And quality of life. So if someone's early in a disease trajectory and maybe in an early stage of an illness, still going on vacations with the family, they have a cruise plan next week, they're going to their card games every Wednesday night, they're still able to do all of that stuff. They may have very different goals than somebody who's so sick they can't leave their house anymore. Maybe they can't even get to the bathroom or shower themselves anymore. So those two patients because of how they ex are experiencing their life, may have very different goals. But all of these things, I made them equal, but for different people, different parts of these may be bigger or smaller, depending on what they want. But you kind of put all of this stuff together to come up with what, what are your goals. So I want to share a story with you, because um, like I said, when, when you con sometimes I'm consulted just for goals of care on a patient. And I used to work in the hospital um, before I was working in the clinic setting. And I had a patient who, she had very, very severe heart disease. Um, she was really at what we would call end-stage disease. From a doctor's perspective, we didn't expect this woman to live much longer. She was in a nursing home. She couldn't walk anymore. Um, she needed bed baths. Um, she really wasn't eating much anymore. Um, she had been in the hospital about 10 times in the last year, all related to things going wrong with her heart. Um, and so she got put in the hospital again, and she was on the floor where they can watch your heart rhythm on a screen. That's called telemetry. So she was on the telemetry floor, and she was so sick. She was the kind of patient you walk into and go, this might be the hospitalization where she doesn't make it out of the hospital. That's how sick she looked. But she was a full code. She kept saying, I want to live. I want to live. I don't, I'm not ready to die. I want to live. And the cardiologist would go in and see her and say, there's nothing more we can do for you. And then they'd leave. The nurse is on the floor. She was having these arrhythmias. Her heart was beating funny in a way that is very scary, in a way that people die from. So the nurse is on the floor going, oh my gosh, what do we do? We're just waiting to put her on life support. She's a full coat. She's going to get chest compression. She's going to get shocked. She's going to end up in the ICU on life support. But she's dying. And the cardiologist, they call, and the cardiologist say, there's nothing I can do for her. So it was total chaos. So I get consulted, and I go in, and I just start talking to her. I pull up a chair. She, could, she was so short of breath, she could barely talk. But we start having a conversation, and I'm, I'm trying to learn why, what is it that's making her want to live when she's so sick. And what I found out is that she'd been living in this nursing home for two years. She was absolutely best friends with her roommate. She couldn't stand the thought of leaving her alone. That's why she wanted to live. So I said, what if I could figure out a way to get you to your nursing home room today? You and I both know you're going to die. You can die with your roommate at your side, or you can die here on life support in the ICU. Those are your choices. And within two hours, I had her back to her nursing home with her roommate with full comfort measures so she wasn't short of breath. So we weren't watching this heart rate and having all the nurses run in every time it happened. And she died two days later holding the hand of her, of her roommate. So that's an example of when the medical team is saying, there's nothing more I can do. They're over here. The patient's saying, but I want this, creates total chaos. 
But when we get those things aligned, when we really figure out what are our goals and we get everybody headed in the same direction, it's a good, that was a good case to share with you guys so you can see how things then go very, very smoothly once everybody's on the same page, okay? So how do you figure that out? And it's just what I said, you, you talk. You talk about what's most important to you. Explore your beliefs and values. You explore, explore what gives your life quality. Even sick people can have good quality of life. There's things that can still give their life quality. And what gives your life meaning? If I couldn't do this, I really wouldn't want to wake up tomorrow. But as long as I can do these, these things, then I want to keep going. And all of these things need to be well documented in a patient's chart. Because if we don't have this well documented, then what's the point? The doctors aren't going to know what's important to you, but you're going to be fighting for those things. But my job is to bring all of this together. So now we're going to talk about the paperwork, OK? Because you know, every time you, every time you go into the hospital, have you filled out your advance directives? And then they might give you a packet. And then you take it home, and you start reading through it. And you're like, oh my gosh, I don't even want to think about this stuff, right? That's what I see in my clinic all the time. Patients rarely have their advanced directives um, filled out when they meet me. But you can bet they have, by the time I'm done with them, <laughs> they have them filled out. So what are advanced directives? It, the word is you fill something out in advance to direct the doctors what to do. Advanced directives, OK? They're instructions that direct healthcare decision making in accordance with your wishes, should you not be able to speak for yourself. These only take place if you cannot speak for yourself. If you're awake and talking, we don't need advanced directives because you're going to make your own decisions. The doctors are going to come talk to you. They're going to give you your options. And then you're going to make your decision. But sometimes people get so sick that they can't speak on their own behalf. And that's when we look at advanced directives. Sometimes patients end up on life support. They have a tube down their throat. They can't talk. Maybe you're not that sick that you're on life support, but you are just out of it, and you don't even know what's going on. You can't make decisions if you don't know what's going on. So the types of advanced directives we're going to talk about are a medical power of attorney, same thing as a durable power of attorney, okay? Living will, um, and there's something called a Utah Advanced Care Directive. I have to read it every time I say it. And then a pulsed form. Has anybody in here ever heard of a pulsed form? OK, so we're going to go through all of that. It, pulsed form really isn't an advanced directive. It's something a little different. It's even better. So we'll go through that in just a second. So the first thing to talk about is a living will. It's a document signed by the patient, and it states what types of interventions you would want if you became critically ill. It usually talks about things like feeding tubes, IV fluids, life support being on machines to keep you alive, whether you'd want a tube down your throat to breathe. A lot of times they also have a surrogate decision maker. That's the same thing as a power of attorney. OK? I'm going to be completely honest with you. I've been doing this for almost nine years. I have had one living will that was helpful. And the reason is they say things like, if two physicians declare my condition terminal. Well, I have stage four cancer patients that are still getting really aggressive care. Is their condition terminal? Well, yeah. Are they going to die today? No. Are they going to die in the next year? Probably not. So how do I interpret that? They're, they're not term, I mean, they are terminal, but they're not terminal right now. It gets really, really gray. Um, vegetative state and brain death. Those are medical diagnoses that have very specific criteria. Okay, there, we don't just say this person's in a vegetative state. There is criteria you have to meet. Brain death, is a, it's a diagnosis of death. Less than 1% of us are going to die of brain death. 99% of us are going to die of, car, or your heart's going to stop or you're going to stop breathing. I've taken care of probably seven patients who died of brain death in my career so far. Not one of them had a living will. <laughs> So they're just, they're usually, then they're written by lawyers, so it takes you a while to find this information. Sometimes in these situations, I need to know now. I don't have time to read a seven-page document, but I'm the doctor that has to sit down and do it because that's my job. And they're usually created when somebody's healthy. 
So we don't really know what the situation we're going to be in. So there are these really general documents that I'm trying to interpret in a very specific situation. It's really, really hard. The one that was helpful was different than any other living will that I read. And you know why? Because it defined what gave the person's life quality. It had a paragraph titled Quality of Life. And I was like, oh my gosh. So it was so helpful to know what gave that person's life quality because that could help guide the physicians. So to be honest with you, living wills aren't always that helpful. The most helpful part of them are usually when you've named a surrogate decision maker, when you have that in there. The other parts in general, most physicians, it's just really, really hard to use those. So the next form is called a durable power of attorney. And I have a picture of one that you'll see here in a little bit. It's a form signed by the patient. It names your surrogate decision maker. You get to choose. If you can't speak for yourself, who would speak for you? Okay, so you get to decide that. Um, it also lists an alternate agent. So let's say we can't get a hold of the person that you've chosen. You can name a second person. Um, it does not need to be notarized in the state of Utah. It just needs a witness. And there's the, on the forms, it'll tell you who can and can't be the witness. Their job is to make decisions in accordance with your wishes, not what they think is best. And I've seen this happen. It's, with, it's in, within accordance of your wishes. Other things to consider. Um, can whoever you choose, when you're filling out a power of attorney, um, can whoever you choose to be your decision maker handle those emotional situations? So I had a patient in the ICU. He had horrible lung disease. And he knew it. His wife knew it. Um, he ended up on life support in the ICU. His lungs were so sick, he needed machines to breathe for him. And he had been on life support for two weeks, on machines in the ICU for two weeks. And the doctors were really trying to do everything they could to get him better. But we'd gotten to the point that we knew that he had been laying in a bed like this, paralyzed for so long, that at this point, his quality of life after that would have been extremely poor. So we needed to start talking to this patient's wife. She, he had a power of attorney filled out. He, he, he had chosen his wife. So I have a, we bring her in, we have a meeting with her, and we start kind of talking about these things. She was very clear. She said, I, he would have never wanted any of this. But I can't make this decision. It's too hard. I can't do it. And she would leave. She couldn't do it. She emotionally couldn't handle the decision to take her husband off those machines, even though she could say he wouldn't want this. So I want you guys to think about that when you're thinking about who, who would you choose to be your power of attorney. It has to be somebody. I see you guys already thinking right now. It has to be somebody who can emotionally handle that situation. Does the agent know your wishes? I'm, I'm not even going to tell you a specific story about this one because I, I could... So many times, the person did their paperwork. They did their power of attorney. I've got it. I call the person. I bring them into the hospital. So tell me what you've talked about with your loved one, about what they would want in this situation. We never talked about any of this. I, I have no idea. We, we never talked about this stuff. And I'm like, well, what was the point of the paperwork? And then we basically have to start over. Like that paperwork wasn't even filled out in the first place. So you have to have the discussions. That's why this, this lecture is called Beyond the Paperwork. This is so much more than paperwork. Um, and then are they available? I had one who chose their son, but he lived in China. So the time was off, and he worked this crazy job. And, um, and actually, in the laws here in Utah, we can go to the alternate agent if that person isn't reasonably available. Okay, so that's another thing. It's got to be someone who's available. Okay, and just remember, you only, we only use in, in medicine, a doctor only uses a power of attorney if you cannot speak for yourself. If you can speak for yourself, we're going to come talk to you. You're going to tell us what you want. So this only takes place if you're sick enough that you cannot tell us what you want. Okay? So the pulsed form which I asked you guys to raise your hands if you ever heard of it, and none of you have. So I'm really excited. I'm going to teach you guys something new. So it's, it's not really an advanced directive, because remember, an advanced directive, it directs the doctors to tell you what to do. These are actually orders. 
These are medical orders, so that's different. Um, so it translates patients' preferences into medical orders. It's not really advanced directive, and it's meant to travel with the patient. So, you know, sometimes patients end up in the hospital, and then their body gets weaker, so they need to go to a rehab facility after that to get stronger. So then that form goes with them from the hospital to the rehab facility as orders, okay? We, healthy, this form is not made for healthy people. This is what it looks like. It's, they're, they're light blue. This is a pulsed form. So this form travel, if you're at home, you take it there. If you're in the hospital, you take it there. If you go to a nursing home, you take it there. So this travels, and they're actually orders, so it's a little bit different than an advanced directive. And only if you have things like heart failure, COPD, cancer, chronic kidney disease, that's when we fill out this form. This form is not intended for those of us who are pretty healthy. Okay? So, oh, I know. It's kind of... How are you supposed to take it with you if you're sick, though? And then, you don't even know what's going on. Exactly. You don't have to keep track. Well, we're going to get to that. So as long as it's in, if you have, the hospital will send this with you. They know to send this with you. Mm -hmm. Anytime you fill out advanced directives, you know what people do? They lock it in their safe. They lock these forms in their safe, and then we can't, and then they're there, and they're like, oh, yeah, he filled out all that paperwork. And I'm like, okay, where is it? Oh, it's in the safe, only he has the code. Yeah. When my mom lives, she was at a major. They have them on their fridge. Yep, and, and that's where paramedics are going to look for them. So we always tell people when they fill these out to put them on your fridge, but you also need to get copies to all your doctors. You need to give copies to your families. There's no reason it should be in your safe. I can't think of a reason to put this in your safe. So I'm just going to, if you were to come to my office and we, were, we would fill this out, I would take about 45 minutes with you just on this form alone. So we're going to kind of walk through this form pretty quickly. Um, the first part up here is, and it's a little bit scary, but remember, these are medical orders. These are written for doctors. This has to have a doctor's signature, okay? So just remember at the top, that's just your information. It's your name, what are your medical problems, and there's a little place on there that I can write medical goals. So I can free write some stuff on there and really personalize this form. The next section, section A, it's called section A, is cardiopulmonary resuscitation. That's chest compression, shocking. Section A only takes place if your body is starting the dying process. And the doctors need to know, do you want us to try to reverse it, or do you want us to let things happen naturally and let you pass away? So there's two options. There's actually three, but I don't let my patients choose the third one. So um, there's attempt to resuscitate, there's do not resuscitate, and there's I don't, I don't wish to express a preference but that makes the, the form pointless, right, if we use that option. So then the next is uh, medical intervention. So maybe you're not so sick that you're dying, right? We all hopefully have a lot of things that are going to happen between now and then. Um, but you're so sick that you maybe need to go in the hospital. You're in the emergency room. You can actually tell the doctors how aggressive to be. You can tell them full treatment, full core press. I want you to do everything you can to get me better. If I need to be on life support, if I need big tests, if I need a surgery, that's fine. Whatever you need to do to get me better. The middle one says limited additional interventions. So the doctors come to you and say, you're, you're sick enough, we need to put you in the hospital. So you say, I'm fine with that. If you need to do labs and tests, put me on the floor, maybe monitor my heart, antibiotics, IV fluids. But if I get so sick that I need machines to keep me alive, if I need that life support, that is my line in the sand. I don't, I don't want that. So it's limited additional interventions. The third one is comfort measures. You know what, Doc? I've been through a lot. Just, I just want you to keep me comfortable. I don't want you to do anything to prolong my life. I want you to focus on keeping me comfortable. Okay? So the third section, and look at, I love these empty boxes up here because I can take all kinds of notes and I can really personalize this for you because sometimes there's some little nuances with all of that stuff. The third section is whether we'd ever want a feeding tube. And you could say, yep, I'd want a feeding tube as long as I need it. I'm fine with it. The middle option is, okay, I'd be okay trying it for a little bit, but I wouldn't want it long term. If you can try it and get me better and then maybe I can start eating again, I'm fine with that. But I wouldn't want one long term. And the third option is, I don't want a feeding tube ever. And then there's, of course, there's the I do not wish to express a preference. 
This section um, is more, is if you have other advanced directives, I need to review them to make sure they're congruent. And you can, you can put a contact person on here who's your healthcare agent or your power of attorney. I take notes, who did I have the discussion with? Was it just you? Was it with your spouse? Was it with your kids? Um, and then this bottom part is signature. So it has to have a doctor's signature, so you cannot fill out this form alone. You have to do it with your doctor, okay? A nurse practitioner and a PA can also fill these out if you see, see anybody, um, see any of them. Okay, I have to read this. Utah Advanced Healthcare Directive. So this was actually created in the legislature, and it has four parts. We're really just gonna focus on two of them. This is the form that if you're pretty, everybody should have it, and it's in this booklet, and I brought ton, plenty of booklets for you guys to take one or two copies each. So it's in here, okay? Um, the first part is your power of attorney. So you put your personal information here, you choose your first agent, and then you can choose an alternate agent like I talked about earlier. That's who the doctors would contact if you were so sick you couldn't make decisions. they call this person, pers for this person first. If they couldn't get in touch with this person, they call this one. You could also choose not to have an agent, okay? Um, and this part is just more about the power of attorney. You can give them other authorities, participation in medical research, organ donation. You don't have to fill out this stuff, okay? Um, but you can give them access to your medical records, your healthcare financial records. Just remember, all of this stuff we're talking about is medical. It has nothing to do with who's going to get the house and who's going to get the car and who's going to get the cow, right? It, all this has to do with is medical. That's all we're talking about right now. And this, so we're on part two. This is, more, this is part, it's supposed to be like a living will. So you could choose section one saying, you know what, I don't want to make these decisions because I don't know what situation I'd be in when these decisions need to be made. So I'm going to let my agent decide my power of attorney that person that you chose right here, okay? Um, this part, if you want to choose it, you can tell the doctors how aggressive to be here. Prolong my life or just keep me comfortable. And then there's, there's ways, there's more specific questions down here too that you guys can read. I just wanted to point out that there's a blank space. It'd be awesome if you guys would all write in there What's most important to you and what gives your life quality? That's what I would write right there. If I, were, if, if I was filling this out for myself, that's what I would write there. Where are my lines in the sand? Okay. And then here's where you make it legal. You've got to have a witness and then your signature. But it doesn't, you guys can all do this without a lawyer. Okay. Doesn't need notarized. So I wanted to just share a little bit about kind of what I'm thinking about when I walk into a situation where I think I might have to use somebody's advanced directives, okay? So in 2005, Utah created the Utah Commission on Aging, and they did this because in 2006, the first baby boomers turned 60. So there, the state was kind of thinking, okay, how can we prepare for this? What are our resources in the state? So they created this commission to kind of pull all of this together. And so their mission is to promote the dignity, independence, and quality of life for older persons through advocacy, information, and the coordination of public and private programs and services benefiting them. They created this great booklet just for me and for other healthcare providers to help, help us walk through the laws of how can we use advanced directives, what are the laws of the state of Utah. It's a great book, so I just wanted to share just a little bit of this information with you, okay? So when we talk about somebody who's not able to make their own decisions, what I really, what I'm thinking, the medical term for that is do they have capacity? Do they have capacity to make their own decisions? And so there's, we actually have guidelines of how to determine that, and that's what, this is what I'm thinking when I walk in the room to see a patient, because sometimes I've been told this person, they just, they can't make their own decisions, and then I walk out and I say, yes, they can. So um, you have to be able to understand information. You have to be able to evaluate information, weigh risks and benefits. And then you have to be able to communicate. We ha you have to be able to tell us what you want. And there's some really simple questions that we can ask to figure out whether you can do that or not. Okay? 
So surrogates, I, I just wanted to point this out, that in the state laws, it actually says surrogates, they, they have to be expressing your preference. If I think for a second that I've got a, a power of attorney who's not making decisions in accordance with the patient's wishes, I'm going to call risk management like that. I'm not, I don't mess around. My job is to make sure that a patient's wishes are being followed. And if I think for a second that's not happening, you bet that sets off some alarm bells. And the state of Utah has acknowledged that. So I think that's great. So just who, who, does, who does the state of Utah say can be your surrogate? This is all spelled out in the laws. We don't get to decide this as doctors. Okay? So if you've appointed an agent, that's your power of attorney, the form we looked at earlier, that's it. If we can get a hold of the person, if they're 18 years and older, if they know your preferences, no problem. That's who we're going to use. If you don't have um, a power of attorney, then we're going to see if you've ever been appointed guardian. That's actually more common in pediatric patients. Sometimes we see it in dementia as well. In this state, guardians aren't very common. In some other states, they are more common. And then they have a default surrogate system. I call those next of kin laws because most people know what that means, next of kin. I'm from Oklahoma, y'all. So. Um, so default surrogate. First, it goes to your spouse. If you're legally married, if, you've been, if you're not legally married or you're legally separated, then that person doesn't count. I just want to read this second part to y'all. If a court finds that a spouse has acted in a manner that should, be, should preclude the spouse from having a priority position as a default surrogate, that means y'all married people better behave yourself. That's what that means to me. But it's, it's all about the patient and making sure their wishes are being followed and there's no one involved that, that would cause harm. So first the spouse, then children, then parent, then sibling, then grandparent. And these are all considered classes. So if you have six kids, they all get equal power and the majority decision is what we're going to go with. Okay? Yeah. Is it the same with siblings? Yep. It is the same with siblings. We're the way the yes. Well, this is only if you don't have your paperwork filled out. This is what I'm going to do if you don't have your paperwork filled out. I'm going to follow the next of kin laws. Okay? I, I can just already see you guys thinking, oh my gosh, you mean my brother and sister have to get along? You're going to make decisions for me? <laughs> Believe me, I've seen it all. I've seen it all. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, more about that, okay? So, what do you need to do? You need to talk to the people that you love and that care about you and know you. These discussions aren't easy. I do it all the time. But let me tell you, having the discussions now, oh, it's way easier than the ICU. I can promise you that because I have done it in both places with hundreds of families. Okay? If you and I put some questions up here, things for you guys to say. If you had a terminal illness, what would you want? What would be most important to you? Your family needs to know that because this is what should be driving your whole medical plan. It's your goals of care. What do you want out of your life? What gives your life meaning? Where is your line in the sand? And I'm, I'm going to tell you, this is a true story. I had a patient and he got diagnosed with stage four melanoma. And he came to my office and we're filling out this paperwork and he looked at me and said, Dr. Kretka, if I can't go out there and skin up a mountain and ski down it, I am done. And he made me write that in his advanced directive. That's what gave his life quality. And then I have other patients who say, you know what? I'd be okay living in a nursing home as long as my family could come visit me and we could have meaningful interactions. And I've had two patients in my career that have literally said, as long as my heart is beating and I have air moving in and out, you guys better keep trying. I don't care if I'm on life support in the ICU. You keep trying. So do you see this spectrum? If you guys all wanted the same thing, I wouldn't have a job, right? <laughs> but you guys make it hard. We all make it hard, right? So, and you have to work with your doctors, and you have to, you have, to have the conversation. So talk with your family. 
have these difficult discussions. Sometimes, I don't want you guys all to rush home and go, okay, I want this and this and I don't want this. Your family's gonna be like, oh my, where, what did you do yesterday, you know? <laughs> so there's ends to be able to have these conversations. Maybe Uncle Joe had a stroke. Maybe Aunt Betsy got, just got diagnosed with lung cancer. Those are really good times to start thinking, you know what, if this happened to me, or maybe Grandma had dementia, and started saying, you know, I was thinking about Grandma the other day, and I was thinking about those things she went through. And get it in writing, okay? So um, if you're, okay, so I wanna show you the two forms. So this is the pulsed form. It's usually light blue, it can be white. If you're sick, if you have any kind of chronic illness, this is, this is the form you need to work with your doctor to fill out, or a nurse practitioner or a PA. Everyone should work through this booklet. If you're sick, you want to add this to it. Okay, and I've got stacks of both of these in the back of the room. Okay, don't lock them in a safe. Guys, promise me you're not going to put them in your safe. I don't even want them in there, okay? Make copies. Give them to your doctors. Give them to your family, okay? And just say, I wanted to get this done. If I ever get sick, here it is. A fridge is a good place to have this. I've got other patients who are like, I still have friends over for tea. I am not putting that on my fridge. And that's okay. Just as long as your loved ones know where this is. Okay, sometimes the side of the fridge. Yes? I'm still a little confused about how sick you have to be to have a pulse. So if you have a diagnosis like congestive heart failure, so if you're expecting any kind of hospitalizations, you wouldn't be surprised if you got hospitalized. If this is made for patients who move through different healthcare settings, okay? But if you have a diagnosis of heart failure, COPD, chronic kidney disease, maybe a cancer, um, it's never too early to get this filled out. But these for really healthy people who don't really have any diagnosis, it, it's not the right time, okay? The other thing, I, and if you want to talk more individually about this after, that's fine. But everybody should have this one filled out, no matter what, okay? Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, sometimes our health changes. So you may need to re-look at this stuff again. Remember we talked about it, the early I shared, if somebody's got an early stage disease process, still going on vacations, they got a cruise next month, versus somebody who has the same diagnosis but they're further along and they're not doing quite as well, you would probably fill these things out differently. Most people would. So you're going to want to take a look at this periodically and make sure it's still up to date with what your wishes are. And continue to have these discussions with your family and your medical providers over time as things change. Okay. So I want to share with you, when I have patients who go, oh God, you're just going to talk to me about dying now. But remember, those forms, you can fill them out very aggressively. You can tell the doctors to do everything they can to keep you alive. You can fill, this isn't necessarily about dying. They can be about living too. But I can't tell you what a gift getting these forms done is to your family. Because guess what? Then it's your decision. It's not theirs. I can't tell you the gravity of what I just said. It is your decision not theirs. And sometimes they have to remind family members of that when somebody's really sick and it looks like they're starting to die in the hospital and they clearly have said, if I'm dying, let me go. And even when they have that on paper, it's hard for family. It's so hard. And I can at least say to some of them, this is what they wanted. This was their decision. Don't you forget that. This is not your decision. If you don't fill out that paperwork, this then becomes their decision that they have to live with. Mm -hmm. This is a gift that you give to your family so that in those difficult times, it is your decision. It is not theirs. And if you walk away with one thing, it's that shift in paradigm that this is a gift. Get this stuff done for them. Friends, family, loved ones, so that I don't have to help them make this decision because I do it all the time mm. and it's so hard for them, mm. okay? It takes the pressure off them. It comforts them. They can fall back on that. They can fall back on the fact that this was your decision, okay? 
So I think that's all I have today, but I'm, I have plenty of time for anybody who has questions.